welcome to the continuation of the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm very happy to have each of you here tonight and to welcome all of you that are joining us by television or through the radio or on the internet. We're glad that you're here and tuned in and we hope that as we go through God's Word tonight that you will follow along. Be sure and get your Bible and some paper and notes that as we study tonight the 19th chapter of Revelation, the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, and we're going to see what God has to say about how at the end this whole thing is wrapped up, all comes together. So we hope you'll follow carefully as we consider to this subject tonight. Also, we would encourage you to uh, be sure and look at the Scripture, particularly the book of Revelation, because if there's any one book that is, is vital to people today, it's the book of Revelation, because it tells us where we are, and what's happening, what's taking place in the world in preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ. So we hope you'll be sure and get into the book of Revelation and study it as we take a look at it. But tonight, uh, we're looking at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then uh, after that, our presentation, our next presentation is on the millennium. That's where we'll be going, which is the 20th chapter of Revelation. After the marriage supper of the Lamb, then you have the thousand years or the millennium. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to answer such questions as, during this thousand years that it talks about, uh, where is the devil going to be here in that time? Where are the wicked? Uh, where are the righteous? What starts that thousand years? What brings it to close? We'll take a look at all those very important subjects. So we hope you'll be sure and be with us as we get into the subject of the millennium. I think you'll find it to be very, very helpful to you. Uh, we're glad tonight to welcome back the His Voice Quartet. And uh, they're going to sing for you tonight a song entitled, Let the Heaven Light Shine on Me. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy that as I heard them practicing. It sounded wonderful to me. But before they do, Chuck Algar is going to come and he's going to read with you the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. Good evening again. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, please turn them to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19, and we're going to read that together. So if you have your Bibles, Revelation 19, let's read together. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he had judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. And he avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again, they said, Alleluia, her smoke rises forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a loud voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, the marriage of the Lamb, and his wife hath made herself ready. Self ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now I saw heaven open, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. 
His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God Almighty. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and the armies, gather together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. May God add his blessing to his word. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. Oh, brother, you must bow so low. Oh, brother, you must bow. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. Oh, deacon, you must bow so low. Deacon, you must bow so low. For low is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me. Oh, preacher, you must bow so low. Preacher, you must bow so low. For lo is the way. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. Let the heaven light shine on me. For lo is the way to the upper bright world. Let the heaven light shine on me.
Gracious Lord, we look forward to the day that you will come back, that indeed that heaven's light will shine upon us, and that we all might be gathered around that great table and to enjoy the feast, the great marriage supper that you prepared for each one of us. Bless us this evening as we open your word. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts. May it give us wisdom, understanding that we each may prepare our lives and our hearts to be with you. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the great controversy has ended. The victory is won. The time of the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. The conflict is over. And it says here, Revelation 19, it says, After these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor and power belongs to the Lord our God. Now watch carefully as John picks up, reaches back and picks up some of the very first things in the book of Revelation, particularly in the fourth chapter, and now projects it clear to the 19th chapter, because this is what he says, For true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. So he said, this woman, Babylon, who has done this, all this to the servants of God down through the ages, now he has avenged. Avenged on her the blood of all the saints. And again they said hallelujah. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. It's come to an end. And the 24 elders. Okay here you are. Exactly what's mentioned in the 4th chapter. The 24 elders and the 4 living creatures. Fell down and worshipped God who sat on the throne saying amen. Hallelujah. So what John is trying to get across to us here folks. Is that. The things that he said and told in the fourth chapter, those visions have been given to John all down through the book of Revelation that we've studied here. And they, they have now come to a completion, to an end. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures and the angels are all there saying, this has happened as God said it would. Then a loud voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And you find that same thing there in the beginning of the book of Revelation, where it speaks of a voice as a great thunder and as many waters proclaiming God's greatness. And so this is the time in which the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. Babylon is no more. Amen. All the false systems, all the religions, all those that were in opposition to God and have led people away from what God's Word teaches, they have come to an end. They are no more Babylon. It's done. And you and I must understand that this is a great controversy. That this is a struggle between truth and falsehood. This is a struggle between what is right and what is wrong. And look at it any way you want to, folks. There is no halfway. Uh, there is no such thing in Christianity as there is in many of the other religions. There is no such thing in Christianity like the yin and the yang. Which you understand what I'm saying about when it talks about the yin and the yang in 
false religions, that's saying that there's a balance between what is right and what is wrong. There is no balance in Christianity between what's right and wrong. It just doesn't exist. It is what is right, what is righteousness, what is just, what is good. That has come to the place that it has triumphed. And God now is in charge. The seven last plagues have been poured out. God has avenged the blood of his saints and his martyrs down through time. He has avenged them. He has poured out upon Babylon, of old, Babylon double portion in the seven last plagues, the system of falsehood, the system of corruption, the system that led people away from God. That whole system has come to an end. It is no more. And now, since that has come to an end, it's time for the marriage supper of the Lamb. God's going to gather all of his people for this great marriage supper. When he has the marriage supper of the Lamb, folks, you'll find that as John records it, as the Lord gave it to him, it was patterned after a Jewish wedding. That's how the marriage supper of the Lamb is. It's after a Jewish wedding. And the elements of conducting a Jewish wedding is what you have in the marriage supper of the Lamb. So these were the things in a Jewish wedding that took place. One, the bridegroom goes to the home of the bride and pays her dowry. He goes to there pays the dowry. There was no such thing as a wedding, as a marriage, if he didn't pay the dowry. He had to pay a dowry. Maybe it was different, uh, depend on what the father asked, what the dowry was, but he had to pay the dowry of whatever it was. And by the way, the dowry belonged to the wife. She's the one that got the dowry. That was her uh, guarantee, if you please. That if the home broke up, she took the dowry. That was hers. And so it belonged to her. And there was no such thing as a wedding without him paying the dowry. Okay. Secondly, he then returned to his father's house to prepare a place for her. After he'd gone to the father, talked to them, had paid the dowry for his wife, then he goes back and prepares a place for her. Because up to that point, there was no guarantee of the wedding. But once he had paid the dowry, then it was solid, it was sure, and he went back and prepared a place where they were going to live. And many times there he built a home at by his father's home. That's where he built a home for he and his wife. And that was the place that he built. After he had built a place, prepared a place for her, the bride during this time stays at the father's house while preparing herself for the wedding. So it's during this time, while he's off building a home for them, she is to get herself ready for the wedding. This is when she does all the preparation for the wedding. That's what took place. They got ready for the wedding. And as you read through the scripture, uh, you find many, many cases of that where it talks about a wedding and it talks about how the bride got herself ready for the wedding. That was a, it's typical of a Jewish wedding. For when the bride in the home is ready, the bridegroom returns for his bride. So when the house is built, everything's ready, the bride has got herself all ready, then he comes back to get the bride, claim his bride. And then from there, he takes her to his father's house for the wedding. That is how a Jewish wedding took place. And this whole story and the marriage supper of the Lamb 
is built on that. And if you understand that, all of a sudden you can see exactly what Christ did. Because it all falls within what took place here at the wedding. For instance, it tells us, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, the two shall become one flesh. In other words, a man leaves his home of his parents and goes to find a bride, find a wife, shall leave them, finds a wife, says he shall be joined to her, and God simply takes that whole situation and compares it to what he does with the church. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So he takes that whole scenario of courtship, wedding, and all, and compares it between Christ and and his love for the church. That's what he has here. All right. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. So he said. All of it's taken place. You need to rejoice. Be merry. For the time has come. The wife has made herself ready. Okay. And to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. She is arrayed, fine linen, clean, bright, for this is the righteous acts of the saints. Hmm. How does that happen? How does that take place? The righteous acts of the saints. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are what? True sayings of God. He said, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. These are true sayings of God. Well, let's look at it. Christ decided to leave the Father's house. Made that decision to come to this earth. Came here. Jesus, knowing that the Father hath given all things into his hands, that he had come from God, that he had what? Come from God and was going to God. He came from his Father's house. Coming here for what purpose? What's he coming here for? To pay the dowry. Coming to pay the dowry. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. With the glory which I had with you before the world was. So he was there. In the beginning with his father. And he said now I've come to the earth. I have done what you've asked me to do. Glorify me. With the glory I had with you. Back even before this world. Ever existed. So he's coming to this earth. To get his bride. To pay the dowry. For her. And at Calvary. He paid the dowry. Do you understand that? He paid the dowry. That means he paid it for you. Amen. Paid the dowry. Listen to this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and what? Gave himself for her. That was the dowry. The dowry required for him to give his life. For her, highest price that could be asked. That he would have to lay down his life for her. And remember, who gets the dowry? The bride. Yeah. Paid it. Paid it for her. It's good for eternity. 
throughout eternity, that dowry is good. It's a guarantee that you and I can be in the kingdom of God, that he paid it for us. And so he paid the dowry, and after he paid the dowry, then what did he do? Oh, he went back to his father. Christ returns to father to prepare a place. Paid the dowry. That, that was the guarantee. There, there was no question, folks. Please understand that when he died on Calvary, that settled it. There was no question after that. He could go back to heaven and now he could prepare a place for his bride. And so he left. And the text that all of you know. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So he said, I'm going to go away. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And so he went back to his father to prepare a place for his bride. That's what he's been doing. Preparing a place for you and for me. Probably... His preparing a place for us could be done a lot, lot faster than the time that it took for the bride to prepare herself. I'm afraid that the length of time that we've been on this earth from the time that he left to go back to his father to this day is not because he has been slow in preparing a place. I'm afraid it has more to do with the bride getting herself ready. And his wife has made herself ready. How? How does she make herself ready? ready for him to come back. Well, let's see what it says. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. In other words, it says that this washing process, the cleansing that takes place, all takes place by the what? It all takes place by the Word. In other words, this is how the cleansing process takes place. is by the Word. Are some of you staying dirty? Hmm? Are you... Not being washed because you're not spending any time in the Word? Because that's what's cleansing. What, what does that do? What does the Word do for you and for me? That He might present her to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That all takes place by the Word. So, dear friend... Get out your Bible and read. Spend time in the Word of God. There is nothing, nothing, nothing that you do that's more important than the time you spend in the Word of God. Especially in this day and age. That you and I must spend time in the Scripture if we are going to receive the cleansing that he desires to give us. We have to spend time in the word of God. And to her. 
was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Please notice I highlighted that word granted. You see, in the original, that meant given. That's what it means. To her was given, if you please, to be arraigned in fine linen. It's not something that she is capable of her doing of her own works. It's something that was given to her totally and completely, and it comes free. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. The righteousness that you and I need and must have is totally without one thread of human devising. It is completely the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Comes no other way. But I can't have that if I am not willing to spend time with him. I have to spend time in the word for that to take place. For he has clothed me. What now? He, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Puts upon us this robe of righteousness that he alone can give to us. For he has made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, this is how that takes place. Take your Bible. And turn over with me over to Matthew. Gospel of Matthew. 22nd chapter. Matthew. 22nd chapter. Let's look at verse 10. Because Jesus... Jesus told the story of a great supper, referring to this wedding supper of the Lamb. And he had this to say. Let's start with verse 10. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Servants went out. And they gathered the people. What kind of people? Bad and good. It doesn't say just good, folks. It says the wedding hall was filled with bad and good. There in the wedding hall were all kinds of morally good people. People who had been raised... Morally good. Hall is full of them. But the hall is also full of bad people. Which is trying to show you that there isn't really anything within ourselves that makes us acceptable unto him. None of us. Let's go on. Let's see. There's, there's something that is a common denominator among them. Look at verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw a man there who did not have on the wedding garment. The common denominator among them all they had a wedding garment. There were some of them that were good, moral people. There were some of them that were bad. But they had, all of them had the wedding garment. That had been given to them by the king. 
That was the thing that made the difference. That's what gave them right to be there was the wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without the wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. He said, friend, what are you doing in here without the wedding garment? What, what was he going to say? He couldn't say to the king, well, I couldn't afford it. It was free. Didn't cost anything. He didn't dare say to the king, I didn't like it. You don't tell kings that. So what was he going to say? Couldn't say anything. He was speechless. So with you and I. Righteousness of Christ is offered to you totally and completely free. All you and I have to do is accept it and put it on. Covers. Covers all our sins to the morally good. It covers them and to the bad, it covers them. This is given to all. This is the garment of Christ's righteousness. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true sayings of God. You see, the bride is the church. You and I are the guest. And we're invited to the wedding. It's required that we have the wedding garment, which is the righteousness of Christ. Now, I'm going to ask you something. Are you becoming kinder? Are you becoming more loving? Are you becoming more gentle? Are you becoming more forgiving? For that is what is to happen. That is the righteousness of Christ. This is what happens, must happen to us if we're going to do what he wants us to do. Now the bridegroom, when the bride's ready, the bridegroom is going to return to receive his bride. Go come back and get her. Now I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Watch again as John reaches back to the very first chapter of the book of Revelation and pulls out many of the attributes of Jesus Christ. Because you have a word description of Christ in the first chapter of Revelation. Here he comes back with some of the same descriptions of Christ. Righteousness. He judges and makes war. His eyes were like the flame of fire. On his head was many crowns, and he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The name is called what? There, there must be some relationship between this book and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to get to know him, you find him right here. Amen. That's where you find him. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. And with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. 
And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Why? Why would he have his name written on his robe and on his thigh? Why would he do that? Because his robe is a robe of righteousness. And he is righteous. But you find it's written on his thigh because that's a sign of his covenant that he makes with you and with me. The covenant he makes and says, I will be your God and you shall be my people. And he said, I'll remember your sins no more. And I'll cover you with my righteousness. And I will be your God. And so here he is coming back and he's saying, I am the King of kings, the Lord of lords. I am your God. You are my people. Gathers his bride. Now you have to understand that uh, he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And since he is that there is a certain amount of how should I put it cleaning up that he has to do so you have the marriage supper of the lamb where you're invited you're a guest you can be there and being that you're a guest he in his majesty and in his kindness and his love gives to you the robe of his righteousness. But if you don't want to be involved in the marriage supper of the Lamb, if you don't want to go to it, then there's another supper that you will go to, whether you want to or whether you don't. And both these suppers are pictured in this chapter. And it describes it. It speaks of this angel that stands in the sun. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Now this is not the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is the supper of the great God. Okay? Inviting all the birds to come for this supper. Watch. That you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. Invitation. Come. You may eat the flesh of all those that spurned the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You see, dear friend, it, it's your choice. It's up to you to choose. It has to be your choice. Whether you are going to be a guest at the marriage supper of the Lamb, or whether you're going to be at the supper of the great God of the great God Almighty, where the birds will come and they'll eat the flesh of all people. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. All in opposition to God. Come. To war against the king of kings and the lord of lords. Going to fight him. Be against him. 
And then the beast was captured. And with him the false prophet, who worked, worked signs in the presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So here he speaks of the beast, the false prophet. They're there. They're part of this great group of people there. And the beast was captured. And the false prophet. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. You see, what it's talking here, folks, is this great trinity of evil. This trinity that was absolutely opposed to God and to the teaching of God's word. These are captured, thrown in the lake of fire. Someone else is too. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Uh, when it says they were killed with the sword that proceeds from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, what proceeds from his mouth? What's the sword? The word of God. You see, they once time said something about Christ judging. He said, I don't judge you. He said, the words judge you. You see, you have to come to the place in your experience where when you read what it says, you're willing to accept what it says. I run on to people that read what it says, but not willing to accept it. Or read what it says and say it doesn't make any difference. I, I, in my own personal experience, I had to come to the place where I decided that I had to give the Lord... The right to call the shots. Amen. That I could not. Go on through life. Calling the shots. That I had to let him. Say yes this is what you do. Yes this isn't what you do. And I had to accept that. And say yes Lord. If I'm not willing to do that. Then he can't do his work in my life. He can't do for me what he needs to do. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, dear friend, must come into our life and do its work to change us and to make us different, to make us love one another, to make us be kind and tender and loving. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, and I have to be submissive to that work. These will make war with the Lamb. This is referring to the ten kings, the beast, the false prophet. These will make war with the Lamb. The Lamb will overcome them, for He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. You're called. You're chosen. You're supposed to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. These have made war with the Lamb. Then the beast was captured. And with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. As we said, the beast, the false prophet, they've been ca captured. They have been cast into the lake of fire. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Watch. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So here you have all three. The beast, the false prophet, the devil. They all have been cast in the lake of fire, which is basically saying, dear friend, that he has brought this to an end. There will be sin, 
no more. It's forever ended. And he's going to put an end to it. The rest were killed with the sword, which proceeds from the mouth of him who sits on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. The angel came, invited him to come and to eat the flesh of kings and captains and horses and so forth. And it says they were filled with their flesh. Now watch as Jeremiah gives you an insight into what happens here. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. Do you understand what he's saying? When he says here, I beheld indeed there was no man. The birds of the heaven had fled. Oh, folks, he's just saying supper's over. That's what he's saying. The birds have come and they've eaten them. There's no man. They fled. It's over. Brought it to an end. Sin, sinners will be no more. Righteousness, God's kingdom, will be for eternity. To you and to me, he gives that wonderful promise. I will come again, receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So tonight, the King of Kings Lord of Lords is inviting you to come to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Dear friend, you may have classified yourself as some of those guests that were bad, but please notice he had a wedding garment for each one of them. And that garment covers that person or you may be this person who has been raised in the church you may be one of these individuals that I hear say oh I know all that but in the depth of your soul you know that you are lost just the same as that person that's bad but the Lord simply invites you to come. He has a robe of righteousness to cover your life that you and I may have the marvelous privilege of sitting down and eating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us pray. Father in heaven, for your invitation, we thank you. May we each one reach out and accept this marvelous gift, indescribable gift, that you paid the dowry that we each can be saved. May each one here and those that are listening, those that are watching, reach out tonight and accept you into their lives, we pray in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Good night. In the heart of Southern Illinois lies a small town named after A.J. Nason, who came in 1923 with plans for a dream city and the largest coal mine in the United States. Surveyors laid out the streets and the sidewalks, and workers built the tallest smoke stack in the country, complete with a Spanish turret and decorative cathedral doors at the top. Railroad tracks were laid, and as the word of this dream city spread, people flocked in by the thousands. But as the black coal came out of those deep tunnels, miners came closer and closer to the end of the dream. And after just three years of mining, an underground river flooded the shaft. Suddenly, the operations became very costly. And although Mr. Nason poured millions into his mine, eventually it was taken over by the bank. People left the city in droves. Some didn't even bother to take their furniture. 
Soon the tracks lay dormant. Weeds grew up around the beautiful train station and abandoned homes gave way to trees. Today, locals say that Nason is the only town in America where you can hunt quail from the sidewalk. Although other coal companies tried to revive it, Nason's mine never again turned a profit and today only a few hundred people are left. Mr. Nason's dream went up in smoke. All that remains is a beautiful smokestack, an old train station, and miles of deserted tracks. The Bible says earthly treasures are easily stolen by thieves and destroyed by moth and rust. But our Heavenly Father is building a dream city with streets of gold and mansions by a crystal sea. He invites us to come live with Him for eternity and never grow old. The Bible also says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And in this day and age, when stocks lose their value in minutes and entire banking systems fail, God invites us to put our treasures in things of eternal value. Friends, nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Won't you help us bring the good news of salvation to those who are lost? Please, ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you do. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series The Final Events may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven part series including The Scarlet Beast, Ten Kings, God's Last Call, Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Millennium, The New Jerusalem, and The Victory is One may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors. In the heart of Southern Illinois lies a small town named after A.J. Nason, who came in 1923 with plans for a dream city and the largest coal mine in the United States. Surveyors laid out the streets and the sidewalks, and workers built the tallest smoke stack in the country complete with a Spanish turret and decorative cathedral doors at the top. Railroad tracks were laid, and as the word of this dream city spread, people flocked in by the thousands. But as the black coal came out of those deep tunnels, miners came closer and closer to the end of the dream. And after just three years of mining, an underground river flooded the shaft. Suddenly, the operations became very costly, and although Mr. Nason poured millions into his mine, eventually it was taken over by the bank. People left the city in droves. Some didn't even bother to take their furniture. Soon the tracks lay dormant. Weeds grew up around the beautiful train station, and abandoned homes gave way to trees. Today, 
Locals say that Nason is the only town in America where you can hunt quail from the sidewalk. Although other coal companies tried to revive it, Nason's mine never again turned a profit, and today only a few hundred people are left. Mr. Nason's dream went up in smoke. All that remains is a beautiful smokestack, an old train station, and miles of deserted tracks. The Bible says earthly treasures are easily stolen by thieves and destroyed by moth and rust. But our Heavenly Father is building a dream city with streets of gold and mansions by a crystal sea. He invites us to come live with Him for eternity and never grow old. The Bible also says that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. And in this day and age, when stocks lose their value in minutes and entire banking systems fail, God invites us to put our treasures in things of eternal value. Friends, nothing is more valuable than a human soul. Won't you help us bring the good news of salvation to those who are lost? Please, ask the Holy Spirit what He would have you do. Please consider what you can do for those who still don't know about Jesus. As the Holy Spirit impresses, please send your tax-deductible gifts to Kenneth Cox Ministries, Post Office Box 1027, Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or call us toll-free at 888-747-1844. Thank you for helping us spread the light of God's Word through television. Your gifts bring the blessed hope of salvation to millions around the world. The Revelation of Jesus Christ is available on DVD. Each individual program from the series, The Final Events, may be received on a single DVD for only $10 plus shipping and handling. The entire seven part series, including The Scarlet Beast, 10 Kings, God's Last Call, Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Millennium, The New Jerusalem, and The Victory is Won may be ordered as a set for $59.95, which includes shipping and handling. To order, call 1-888-747-1844 or write to Kenneth Cox Ministries, P.O. Box 1027 Loma Linda, California, 92354. Or you may order online at kennethcoxministries.org. The Revelation of Jesus Christ on DVD. Each individual message on a single DVD or in a set. It's a great way to share this life-changing message with your family, friends, and neighbors.